George of Japan here with another episode about Wednesday's downtown. I'll be introducing some theories, giving background information and context, a short summary, and my final thoughts. If you want to see me keep following this show, be sure to leave a like, and I'd love to know what theory you thought was most interesting, so please leave a comment. Yeah, without further ado, let's go! Okay, translation notes again. <coughs> okay, first theory. The falling blackboard eraser prank has a 0% success rate. A classic prank which has been done in school dramas, manga, and anime. It's a simple prank that involves placing a chalkboard eraser in the entranceway to fall on the teacher. But would it actually work in real life? The show's staff went to two junior high schools to interview the teachers. While most of the teachers had experienced the prank, none of them had ever been hit by the eraser. Most of the teachers see the trap before entering, and even if they didn't, it would always fall in front of them before entering. It seemed like this theory was about to be proven true. However, the show's staff is incredibly diligent, and they consulted Rikao Yanagita the head of the Sci-Fi Fantasy Science Research Institute. In a nutshell, he tries to scientifically explain how things could work in sci-fi movies, manga, and anime. He also tests fan theories. I really want to read his books now. Anyway, Mr. Yanagita told the staff with a longer fall the prank would be possible. After a calculation, he concluded that placing an eraser at the height of 3.45 meters would successfully hit a 1.7 meter tall person. The show then searched for such an entrance, and found this warehouse, which had a 4 meter entrance. Yeah, it wasn't even a school anymore, but the staff was determined to prove this theory wrong. The prank went off perfectly, but it was kind of painful. Uh, the eraser had flipped during the fall, and the hard part hit his head, actually. I, I love the extent the staff is willing to go to to prove some theories wrong. Or right. And what? There's a... what was it called? I, I, I didn't know a Sci-Fi Fantasy Science Research Institute existed. Uh, th this guy, Rikako Yanagita, he, uh, well, he actually didn't graduate from university, but he's a Tokyo University dropout. That, that's, that's still pretty prestigious. <laughs> it's, it's harder to get into Japanese universities than it is to get out. Well, I don't know about the Tokyo University, but if he got in, he's got to be pretty smart. Next. If Cool Poco continued their gag, they could actually make mochi. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna need to explain this one. Cool Poco are a comedy duo that rose to fame in the early 2000s. Their jokes are performed while pounding mochi. Their gag formula is pretty much the same. This dude sets it up, usually talking about a guy who's trying to be cool. This dude screams, what? You really did it now? Uh, Follows like a, a real man would. Then he says one word, a real man would, and then he says another word more loudly, followed by another short comment. I remember I couldn't catch a lot of their jokes back in 2000-something, but his facial expressions and energy always made me laugh. Anyway, during the joke, he strikes the mochi twice. So I guess this theory seems possible to accomplish, but since mochi pounding is done rapidly to prevent the rice from drying out and hardening, Cool Poco faced a tough challenge. Furthermore, they have a finite number of jokes that they can perform. They ended up having to pull out some really old jokes from their early work to complete this. Yes, after a grueling two hours and 104 of their jokes, they successfully made mochi. Which means it takes about 208 strikes to turn rice into mochi. I don't know about you, but I love obscure trivial knowledge like this. Hey Mr. O! Do you know how many hits it takes to turn mochi into rice? 208. Next. There are seriously zero soba shops that sell udon in Kagawa. Background. There is seriously zero of something is a reoccurring theory presented by Tamuda Kenji. Another example of this theory is that there are seriously zero people who eat convenience stores Nikuman in Yokohama's Chinatown. The results of that were surprising. Anyway, 
Kagawa is famous for its udon. It took on the name Udon Prefecture in 2011 to promote tourism, and it's a staple food there. The idea of the theory is that the few soba shops wouldn't bother making udon when there are tons of specialized shops. The show went and interviewed soba shop after soba shop, and after finding no udon in five shops, one finally appeared. When asked why he sold udon, he said before the udon boom, many soba shops sold both udon and soba. But after the boom, many soba shops shifted to only sell udon. He said he just never really paid that much attention to trends. But does anyone come to a soba shop to order udon? The show investigated and found many customers ordered katsudon and that this shop also sells ramen. And after an hour investigation, the first order for udon came in. Results. There are no absolutes in this world. I really like Tamura Kenji's theory here. There are seriously zero people who do this, or there are seriously zero people who do that. It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, again, I haven't seen every episode of the show, so I don't know if he's actually made a successful theory. But if you know, I uh, please leave a comment. I, I'd love to know if he's succeeded in finding there's zero people who do something. Anyway, I'll, I'll keep watching the show. I hope I find one. Performing a giant swing causes equal damage to both wrestlers. I guess I don't really need background information for this. Um, this is a giant swing. It's a wrestling move. Um, in order to ensure both people are of equal physical ability, the show contacted The Touch. They're a twin comedy duo. Pretty small guys, actually. However, they both could not perform the giant swing, so the show called in a more fit duo, the Kudo Brothers. They had them compete in a beach flag race after doing five revolutions of the giant swing. The experiment found the person initiating the swing was noticeably more dizzy in both trials. Results. The initiator of a giant swing takes more damage. Yeah, I guess that was kind of predictable, but I'm still glad the show went out of its way to research it. <laughs> yep, I guess that's all I got for now. Hope you liked the video. Um, have a glorious day.